Tragedies are a work of art which explores with great seriousness the questions around what makes humans unique and what our role in the universe is. The element of tragedies as we know them today was defined mostly by Shakespeare, in which most tragedy explores a downward spiral of a main character and generally end in a sad ending. So, let's talk about Tokyo Ghoul! Hi, so, I have a confession to make. I never was a fan of anime. There is something about the dub versus sub debacle and the anime tropes that never sat right with me. But I also never tried, really, so one day when I was watching a series with a friend of mine and they proposed to watch anime, I accepted to make them happy, ready to be mildly entertained for 20 minutes, maybe. So, I proposed Tokyo Ghoul, a show I've heard very little about, but I've heard great critiques, so my friend accepted, and I was dumbfounded when I found a pilot that was raw, twisty, full of gore, but somehow delicate. The quote that got me into the whole show was this one. I'm not the protagonist of a book or anything. I'm a college student who likes to read like you could find anywhere, but if you were to write a story with me as the main character, it would certainly be a tragedy. So I'm trying something new. This will be a video essay type of audio, over three different illustrations I've drawn from the show. There will be some spoilers, minor spoilers more, I'm gonna try to not go really deep into the major spoilers, but still beware of spoilers. I will be focusing on the anime since I'm not totally done with the manga. Joke aside, I really want to buy the box set of Tokyo Ghoul Re, but it is not available anywhere in Canada right now, so I'm literally stuck waiting for it to be available to go on with Tokyo Ghoul regularly because I really want to read both of them. Anyway, I digress. So today, our question is gonna be, what truly makes Tokyo Ghoul a great tragedy? For those like me who are not very well versed in the anime and manga genre or that world, um, I can uh, compare it to something I like. Uh, in the Marvel Comics canon, my favorite stories were always the X-Men. There's a lot of... there's something with those stories that concern humans and the way that they deal with difference and the fighting a system that is oppressing that I always really enjoyed. And there are a lot of connections to make between Tokyo Ghoul and X-Men. Both deal with racism but also queer identities and queer culture. If you're going to watch Tokyo Ghoul, beware of gore, notions of self-harm and suicides, hate crime, police brutality, and queer-coded plot points. But here is a shortened version of the premise of Tokyo Ghoul. If you want to go in totally blind, this is your warning. Uh, watch the pilot, and then come back when you're totally hooked on this great show. Tokyo Ghoul's story starts in a small cafe in the 20th ward of Tokyo. Ken Kaneki and Hide, his best friend, are talking about a new wave of ghoul attacks in their ward. Ghouls are creatures that feed on human flesh, seemingly without ever feeling full. The media talks about one in particular, the binge eater. Ken Kaneki brushes it off and informs Hide he has a crush on a very pretty girl that comes often at the cafe. He's particularly interested in her because she reads books, a lot of books, but one in particular, The Black Goat's Hag his favorite book by his favorite author. They get a date at a bookstore together, and he noticed that she doesn't really eat much. They go back home together. But at the branch where they were supposed to be separated, Rize, the pretty girl, she informs him that she's scared to go on her own, since the ghouls seem to feed a lot in her neighborhood. He follows her, and she informs him that she, too, is very interested in him. In his flesh, that is. The next sequence is an action pack chasing around the alleyway where Rize informs him that she is in fact the binge eater. She is very hungry for Kaneki. The scene stops abruptly when they arrive at a construction site where huge piles of metal fall on Rize after she had a feast on Kaneki's body. Kaneki wakes up in a hospital after a vision of Rize. It was announced that Kaneki was saved using organs and blood from the poor young woman who was crushed in the accident. He now lacks an appetite. Not quite. Just... just an appetite for human food. Soon enough, he gets lost, smelling something that finally smells good enough for him to eat. Only to find a ghoul feeding on a corpse. 
One of the organs that was given to him was a sac that contains a cognate, the ghoul's defense mechanism, and their source of RC cell basically what makes a ghoul a ghoul. Kaineki found out a cafe he was visiting is run by ghouls, and they take him in to go through this journey. Not quite a ghoul, no longer a human. Okay, so this is the final warning. If you think this might interest you, please, please, please go watch the show. If it's only for the first season, it is really incredible. I also have to say that season one finale is the best show finale I've ever seen, and I know that sounds weird, but there is something about that finale that is just so hype. It is so good. So please, go watch it. But now, we're gonna talk about the tragedy. And I think the tragedy is easiest to follow in three different character arcs. So let's start with part one. Hinami. Maybe at first thought, for people who know the show, Hinami might not be the character that is the most important to talk about this discussion. But her character arc is the first one that solidifies the intense dread and the tragedy of this story. Hinami is one of the first ghoul Kaneki meets. She is a runaway with her mom. They don't hunt, it was the job of Hinami's father, which tragically died at the hand of the CCG, the Commission of Counter Ghouls. A police force that kills ghouls for the quote-unquote better safety of humans. Their rules towards ghouls are simple. Ghouls are not humans, thus not protected by the law. If you kill a ghoul, you get rid of a monster. Hinami and her mom came to the cafe on Teku to get food and help. Toka, one of the maids at the cafe and Kaneki's friend slash enemy, because they are in constant revelry, becomes really close with the girl and takes care of her in her mother's absence. One day, Kaneki finds enemy feeding in her room by accident. When he came to apologize, informed that seeing a girl ghoul eat is impolite, she asks him to help him out to read. And, lo and behold, she presents him a book from his favorite author. Kaneki helps Sinemi, and he becomes a teacher of sort. He grows a bond with her. Tragedy strikes when mother and daughter go alone in town, trying to be independent, thinking that nothing bad would happen, only to be cornered by two CCG investigators. One of them being the man who brutally murdered Hinami's father, and still uses his kagane as his main weapon. It sent the mother into a blind rage. She asks Sinemi to run, before being brutally murdered by Kure Omado, the same man who murdered her husband. Hinami didn't quite see the murder, only shielded quickly by Kaneki who saw it all. Hinami hangs on. She lives with Tokunao and... I identify her as a mother figure of sorts, and Kaneki becomes her big brother. Hinami is meant to represent a truly tragic hero. She's a child that has no control upon what she is. She's generally non-violent, but she still gets punished for the simple act of existing. Her story is incredibly touching, and it gets worse when Toka kills the investigator, almost dying in the process, forever making herself a prey for the CCG. Someone that he would try to hunt and dispatch. Tragedy solidifies when her mentor, her friend, her big brother, gets kidnapped and later betrays her. Part 2. Juzo. On the opposite side of the spectrum, literally, we've got one of the main antagonists of the first two seasons, Juzo Suzuya. I'm using the word antagonist loosely here, because Tokyo Ghoul's story is formulated to have no quote-unquote villains, except the CCG as an organization and a society that lets ghouls be hunted for sport. But I digress. Juzo was adopted as a kid by a vindictive ghoul nicknamed Big Madam. She was torturing him, rented him to other ghouls to do tricks or to fight ghouls and kill them. Forced exposure to death and corpses, most of them he had to kill himself, desensitized them to the idea of death as a concept and it clouded his moral compass. When the CCG raided Big Madam's hideout, they captured a young Suzia, seeing potential in his ways, his violence tendencies that is. They invited him to join the CCG as a second chance. He went to school and studied to become an investigator. When he finally got into the CCG, even alongside these other murderers, he was regarded as one of the worst. Small in nature, he is quick. He was sent first in many raids, clearing a pact for her other's investigator to go in. Most of them were scared of him. Susie's character is an interesting one, because not only is he complicated, morally all over the place, but he's a great contrast to Kaneki in multiple ways. Susie is a human that had to grow up in the ghoul's world, a world in which he doesn't belong. 
And one of the most striking quote of this character is when he's talking to his partner and supervisor, explaining a little bit about his psyche, that he doesn't fear that or quite understand it to be frank. Juzo doesn't understand why people are sad to see people die. To which his supervisor respond that if Juzo were to die, he would be sad. Suzy has spends the rest of this series developing into a better person, slowly getting brainwashed by the CCG and their rationalization of ghoul murders, searching for another parental figure. Juzo is a really interesting character and his story is tragic and it shows that when you are in a vindictive society, some people are going to prey on other people's fear, insecurities, and trauma to make them weapons. Part 3. Konaki, Rize, Intertwined Fate, and the Meaning of Tragedy There is very little that we know about Rize Kamishiro. She was both feared and respected by most ghouls, including the ones of Anteku, although most of them were aware that she was bringing them trouble in the 20th Ward with her overfeeding. Most ghouls over the series are familiar with her tentacles, claw-like kagune that Kaneki later inherits. Overfeeding was her downfall. She was nicknamed the Binge Eater because although a ghoul in average only needs the equivalent of one victim a month to feel satisfied, Rize was noticeably eating too much, too often, and more violently than she had to. She loved to hunt, and she had a thing for young men. Rize found Kaneki interesting, he was definitely the looker type. He wasn't too hesitant to look directly at her chest when she crouched over to talk about a book. Another easy prey. Rize's body might have been lost in the accident, but Rize continued to live, at least in fragments in Kaneki's mind. Kaneki already had a sad past before becoming a half ghoul. His dad died when he was really young and his mom was overworking herself to try and make themselves comfortable while also supporting her sister which asked for monetary help. It is that it revealed that Kaneki suppressed all the memory of her mom physically beating and abusing him. He could only remember how good of a person she was, even though she manifested all of her frustration on him, literally. She died when he was a young teenager. As an orphan, his only family was really his best friend Hide, someone who has a little too much intuition. Toka specifically warned Kaneki she would kill Hide herself if he looked like he suspected anything. To be in the ghoul's world, Kaneki had to completely distance himself from Hide, the only person he had left. And then Jason happened. Alright, I'm not going to go too far into details because this is part of my favorite episode of the show, like the ending of season 1. Without going into too many details, an exposure to a certain ghoul breaks Kaneki. It lets Rize out. The ghoul take over. He becomes the monster he feared so much. Broken, he gives up on his humanity, on his friends, and his life. Kaneki then goes into great lengths to keep his friends alive while simultaneously fighting against them. He is inspired by Toka's brother, Ayato, who did the same, abandoned Toka to try and make their life easier for her. Toka never pardoned Ayato. At the same time, Hide enters the CCG as an intern. Everyone is against Kaneki, and he can barely deal with it. I think it is fairly obvious by now that I am a sucker for character-driven stories, whether it is as a storyteller or a story consumer. I really, really like the media that goes far into a character psyche that studies its character or characters to really flesh out who they are. Tokyo Ghoul is not quite a character study, but in the case of Kaneki, it might as well be because they go so far into his psychology and what he is. Kaneki is not a perfect person. He starts off as a good person somewhat, or at least a shell of one. But the Kaneki we follow quickly evolves to be a mere idea of what he was. Tokyo Ghoul is the story of a guy who makes bad decisions one after the other, and someone who lives through the consequences of his own decisions. One of the recurring troubles of Kaneki's character is his quasi-immortality. After he turns fully into a half ghoul, he is very hard to kill. He not only has one of the most powerful Kagane around, but his health is but his health speed is also greater than most ghouls. It's a hard fact he has to deal with, since his only goal is to save others, but while trying to, he actually hurts more people. He comes to a point where I think he truly believes that the only way to end the suffering is his own death. The end of the second season hit me in the gut. Harder than I truly would have imagined. I cried. More than I usually do. 
The ending to both of these arcs was a gut-wrenching, that long walk with the body of the person Kaneki loved so much is painful the entire way through. Kaneki's story is a downward spiral, from which no matter how hard he tries, he can't escape. And that makes a great tragedy. You empathize with the guy, you learn to love him, and you are mad at him when he does these stupid fucking decisions, even though you thoroughly understand why he made them. Rize's motif in Kaneki's story is interesting, because it goes with the concept of fate, intertwined fate. Rize's death was necessary for Kaneki's character, and Kaneki's suffering could be necessary for a better Tokyo, if only humans were not what they are. Finally, the anime of Tokyo Ghoul solidifies its tragedy in nature with its soundtrack. Unravel is one of the best songs of its genre, and depending on when it is used in the anime, it can make you feel super hyped for what's to come or cry because you are devastated by what just happened. Season 2's Munu is softer, less appreciated, but it has a very special place in my heart because it represents really well what season 2 is. The song is soft and made of pure violence, making for an internal conflict that is poignant. Now, Tokyo Ghoul is not a perfect show, I mean, none is, but there are some very problematic aspects to Tokyo Ghoul I wish to talk about a little bit. I think it is important to watch show critically, and even if Tokyo Ghoul is definitely one of my favorite shows of all time, it is important to notice bad parts of a story. So, there are, you can see that there are a lot of queer analogies that can be done with Tokyo Ghoul. Not only being a ghoul could be an allegory for being uh, gay, but if you do that, you also feel that Kaneki is an allegory for being a bisexual man, which is also supported by the many times he has interaction with many men over the story. But there's something to be said about the queer representation, particularly trans identities in the show. Two characters in Tokyo Ghoul canon are trans, and they both end up becoming villains. One of them is so sick and twisted, she castrates her own son, scared he would end up being a filthy man. Although this is not really in the anime, it is fleshed out in the manga. It doesn't sit right with me. Odesori Sukiyama, which at first is only introduced as someone who lost after Kaneki, someone almost 10 years younger than him, because he is attracted by his scent and he wants to eat him. It is fucked up and I wish it was better. But, nevertheless, Tokyo Ghoul is a deep research of the psyche, a very interesting look into what humans are and what it means to be a human. A look inside a broken world with only broken people that try to reconstruct it. If you have never seen Tokyo Ghoul and you're still hesitant, I'm asking you to give it a shot. Go in and experience the smaller plot lines. Toka and Ayato's complicated relationship, Yashimuro and his fears about ghouls and what ghoul society has become, Uta, Itori, and Yomo's love-hate relationships. This show is a treat. The animation is incredible, the body horror is great, and with its complicated themes, it will make you think about what it means to be human. Thanks for tuning in! Now that this semester is over, I'll try to be more consistent with my upload and I'll try a couple of things. I may do other more research and structures essay-like video, but I will also do videos where I just go in great details about my personal likes and whatnot. Like, you know, just like go and be like, oh, I like this thing and why? <laughs> because, you know, that's that's what I like. Um, Fade the Wing Saga's uh, second slash last podcast-like audio is coming soon. And uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, um, but here's a sneak peek of Bloom and uh, what I designed, because I designed all of the wings in their enchantix form uh, for the next video, so here's a sneak peek. Thanks for hanging out, and see you next time. Bye.